if you want the electronic copies of the, the sermon study and all that, um, sign up, put your, give us your email on the piece of paper over between the bathrooms on the table, and we'll get that sent out to you. Okay. And, and we are recording this, so in, in two or three weeks, as Brent um, gets a, a chance to process the, the videos, we'll get those up. So just keep an eye on our website, and that you'll be able to uh, watch that online or share it if you'd like. All right. Thank you. Good, 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 good. Well, welcome back for the uh, third and final session. And um, this brother, where is it? Oh, over here, uh, said, uh, what about a good commentary on the book of Job? Um, and, and the best one I'm familiar with would be in the New International Commentary of the Old Testament, NICOT, quite often is its uh, an acronym. Um, and um, that it is somewhat, you know, evangelical. Uh, you know, Christ-centered. Uh, it's been out for a while, maybe uh, 25 years or so, and I forget the author's name. If I remembered that, I would tell you. Uh, but you could just Google Job Nicot, um, and uh, you would find uh, a, a nice one-volume commentary on Job. There aren't a lot of commentaries on Job, uh, simply because uh, it's neglected. And uh, it is a difficult book, obviously, to interpret and very difficult to translate because of these uh, 100 or so words that only appear in the book of Job. So, yeah. Okay. So as we talk about the Christ-centeredness of the book of Job, um, and, uh, and uh, finally Christ conquering of Satan, uh, we see this. Uh, a little bit in, for example, chapter 41, where God is still questioning Job, right? One of the 70 questions. Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord? And all of these answers assume, no, I can't, right? A Job can't, neither can we. Can you put a cord through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Can you make a pet of him like a bird or put him on a leash for your girls? Can you fill his hide with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? See, so, so this is if you're going to get your side filled with harpoons and your head filled with fishing spears, that means you're going down, all right? So some of this rhetoric is just control, right? Can you put him on a leash, etc.? But at the end, this is destruction. This is the defeat of Leviathan, who we are saying all along is a preview of Satan. So what is this doing here, right? <laughs> all right, all right. Well, Satan in the book of Job is like Colonel Clink on Hogan's Heroes, right? All right. Clink thought he ran a German prisoner of war camp during World War II. Those inside, however, knew better. They knew that Colonel Hogan, the guy on the right, um, really ran the camp. Clink may have postured and preened, but Hogan had all the power. Just so, Satan may posture and preen in the book of Job, especially in 1 and 2, right, as he kind of roams around. Have you considered, you know, Job? Uh, uh, Satan is so full of himself. Um, but God has all the power, all the power. Martin Luther would often remark, he is God's devil. <laughs> Satan doesn't have absolute power. That's why in Job 41, uh, just going back, we see that he is on a leash. He's on a leash. And the harpoons and spears are on the way, right? Finally, in Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. Harpoons, spears, and finally, fire. So, where have we been? Introduction, Scripture interprets Scripture, uh, faith and works, the centrality of Jesus primarily, in the book of Job, as the one who uh, deals with evil, evil incarnate. Uh, and so now we want to pick up in this last uh, section, uh, 
theology of the cross, theology of the cross, another great uh, gift that Luther uh, rediscovered for us. And then we'll wrap things up with the Lutheran pastor. So the theology of the cross, let's take a look and how this intersects with the book of Job. According to the theology of the cross, the person of faith is not free from doubt, but rather struggles with anguish and doubt. Job is a model struggler, as uh, James 5.11 indicates. Job persevered. Remember that uh, Greek word, hypomona. He stayed in the fire. He, he didn't like the fire. He, he complained about the fire, but he stayed with God, right? Uh, he still was wrestling with God. Um, even Christ himself experienced anguish, right? Uh, those bogged down in doubt and despair may even have the strongest faith. Yet faith repeatedly overcomes doubt. Anguish will depart. Joy will return. Though under the cross, we struggle constantly and vacillate between faith and doubt, joy and despair. That kind of gets back to that idea of, of these uh, high mountains in the book of Job, right? Chapters uh, uh, 9 and then 13 and then 16. Uh, and then, of course, 19 is the, the Mount Everest. Uh, I know that my Redeemer lives. Uh, but as I said, there's a lot of valleys <laughs> from mountain to mountain. Um, so the theology of the cross uh, would indicate that uh, suffering is the uh, allotted uh, design for the believer, um, as James 5.11 tells us. And uh, suffering... Um, uh, is where we struggle and despair and have doubt. And quite often, that's not the sign of, of lack of faith, that's the sign of faith, right? C.S. Lewis uh, famously writes, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So, so the cross, the pain, the suffering, it's expected, and it is actually redemptive, uh, which is something we've been saying all morning. So let's take a, 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 a look then at the different models for suffering um, in, in this uh, overall discussion of theology of the cross. Uh, and this isn't a comprehensive discussion on suffering, but it is kind of a, a, a Lutheran pastor's way of, of at least. Um, uh, having these uh, categories in your mind. Uh, so when uh, things happen, you say, well, is it this or is it uh, A, B, C, or D? See, sometimes we don't know. Sometimes we just don't know. It's interesting. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, uh, the, the secret things belong to Yahweh our God. The revealed things belong to us and our children forever. So the hidden things belong to us. Sometimes we just don't know. It's so hard to, to, to say, well, pastor, why did this happen? Um, and, and sometimes we just have to say, I don't know. There is a hidden God, and, and we only have what is revealed in Scripture, and, and I don't know, all right? Sometimes we've talked about this a little bit already. Um, this is the Pauline idea. Uh, from Job 4 and Galatians 6-7, uh, that it's confession and absolution. Uh, sometimes I don't know why people suffer, right? But sometimes I do. Uh, they're sinners. They've sinned. Uh, so we would take them to a place like 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, right? He's faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's verse 9 of 1 John 1. Sometimes another model when we're suffering is to hope in the gospel against the law. Um, so this is what uh, my good friend, famous Amos, does uh, two times in his first two visions in Amos 7. Um, is he, uh, he says, God, how can Jacob stand because he's so small? And small Jacob stands for the... Uh, despised and downtrodden of the northern kingdom uh, in Amos's day in the early 8th century BC. Uh, so Amos says, God, don't do this. Change your course of direction. 
And Amos gets this from Moses, because this is what Moses does in Exodus 32, right? Of the golden calf apostasy, is, uh, is Moses commands Yahweh to relent, relent. And the Hebrew there would be nakav, uh, in the nifal, <laughs> uh, relent. And that's uh, related to nakam in the piel, which means comfort. Right, Nakamu, Nakamu, Ami, Yomar, Elohekim, Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. So, so Yahweh Nakams in the Nifal <laughs> in Amos chapter 7. Yahweh Nakams in the Nifal in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. So sometimes God changes his course of direction based upon compassion. Remember, it means comfort, comfort, have compassion. So, so sometimes we pray, God change what's going on here i don't have a job i need a job my kid's sick he needs to be healed i don't have any money i need money see um so that's that is a very biblical way to pray paul prays this way second corinthians 12 three times he asked the lord to take away the thorn of flesh where did paul get that idea well people like amos moses um of course, when we hope in the gospel against the law, we need to, we need to be ready for 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So sometimes God will say no to this prayer, but it doesn't mean we can't pray it. See? God, change what's going on here. And, and, and just a little bit more specifically on number three, is this would be in terms of what we would call the fourth article of the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread, right? It's the daily bread. It, it's our physical bodily life that we pray this prayer. Because all the other petitions to the Lord's Prayer, God always answers those, right? Forgive us our trespasses, thy kingdom come, uh, right? Uh, thy will be done. Those are always affirmative. But in, in give us this day our daily bread, you know, <laughs> um, we don't always get the daily bread, <laughs> right? We don't always get the healing um, or the job, uh, etc. But But this is a, an invitation, right, to pray. Um, and sometimes suffering is a blessing in disguise, as we've already quoted from Genesis 50, verse 20. So, so um, as we try and interpret suffering, the problem with the friends and Job is they just go to number two, right? Build that Zophar and Eliphaz. That's all they've got as pastors is, well, there's, there's a problem, so you are getting what you deserve. But um, the only way, as I said earlier, we find out which model to use with people is to talk with them, ask them questions. See? So, so generally speaking, in the book of Job, the friends end up on bullet point two, and God is really bullet point four, right? But there are other models, other responses to suffering. Okay, so Job's startling affirmations of faith that we've looked at already in, in 9, 13, 14, 16, 19, appear incongruous among his expressions of anguish and despair. However, Job is simply exhibiting the vacillation between faith and doubt, joy and despair, which is characteristic of a person of faith. All right. So that's just a modest theology of the cross. I want to spend a little bit more time uh, as we uh, wrap things up on the Lutheran pastor. All right. So what I want to do in this last section is, is really take everything from, from the James 5.11 to, to the book of Job really being the engine driving the rest of the Bible, that scripture interprets scripture, to the centrality of justification by grace through faith apart from works, which is central uh, driving question in Job, to the centrality of Jesus, especially Jesus and the cross to expect suffering, suffering is redemptive, and how does all that then play out uh, in pastoral ministry? So the Lutheran pastor. And we get to our good friend, Elihu, right? Elihu. Um, Elihu's introduction is unique 
in Job in a number of ways. So it lists his genealogy in chapter 32. This is stunning because the others, we get little bits and pieces, right? So we can relate them to Esau or to Abraham, right? Um, but we have a full-blown genealogy of Elihu, which the, the author is saying, this is a really important person, all right? Um, so that's in 32.1. Uh, we are given the purposes for his speaking, the reasons for his former silence, why he chooses to speak. None of this information is given before the speeches of Eliphaz, Bildad, or Zophar. Seen in this light, the Elihu speeches form a bridge between the earlier deadlock dialogues and the solution announced in Yahweh's oracles. So Elihu, this is James 1.19, be slow to anger, right? Slow to speak and quick to what? Listen, listen. So, so, Elihu's a great Lutheran pastor. He's listened. He hasn't said anything until chapter 32. I could never keep my mouth shut for that long. Right? Right? Um, yeah, you know, Lessing is here. I've got all the answers. No, maybe you don't. So we listen. We listen. And so what, what we see here is uh, Elihu then introduces Job to who? Yahweh. See, so, so in, in several of the, the earlier speeches, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz, not to be confused with Elihu, I know that's confusing, but stick with me, lunch is coming. All right. Um, but in, in Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz, quite often it says, the words of Bildad have ended. And then Bildad doesn't talk to you, right? You don't have that with Elihu. See, there's this seamless transition in chapter 37 to chapter 38. So as a good Lutheran pastor, you listen, you respond. He's going to respond with gospel promises, by and large, to Job. And then people are introduced to who? God. In chapter 38, verse 1. So Elihu is a great, great model. Uh, this is John the Baptist, right? Uh, in John uh, 3, uh, we are told, uh, John the Baptist says in, in verse 30, uh, he must increase as Jesus, I must decrease. So that's what Elihu does. He decreases to the point where God confronts Job. And that's what we want to happen with people that we serve, that finally they meet Jesus, right? Jesus has the solution. Jesus has the answers. Jesus has the love, right? Um, so Elihu is a great model here. He describes a possible explanation for the reason uh, God allows suffering. Is it, the friends would have never said this. Pain and agony are the way God reveals himself. Really, that's theology of the cross, right? All right. Uh, God uses adversity to keep people from pride, save them from the pit. The theme of the mediator comes up again, the, the same word that appears in 1620. Uh, Elihu uses uh, uh, in chapter 33, 23. So Elihu uh, is, is a, a great model for Christian counseling, Christian friendship, Christian ministry. Uh, you listen to people. Um, you ask questions. You point them to the mediator. Uh, you introduce them to Jesus. Uh, another piece to this, we're kind of switching gears here for the Lutheran pastor. Is This is really what the Thor, is that your nickname or is that your real name? Oh, your middle name. Okay. So thank you so much for what you said earlier. But um, what, what a Lutheran pastor then does is he, as is, is Thor, middle name Thor, um, teaches us is that we invite people to lament, lament. Um, there are parts of our country that people call flyover country, right? And one of those would be Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Another would be Fort Wayne, Indiana. So 
Yeah, yeah. But flyover country implies that you'd fly over to get more exotic places, right? You fly over Minnesota, Indiana, Wisconsin, right? So there are flyover books, maybe Leviticus, maybe Numbers. Maybe First Chronicles, as I said, it begins nine chapters of genealogies. It's a chore, it's a bore, it's a snore. We say no more, right? And then for many, Old Testament laments are flyovers for the Christian, right? Life is hard enough. Why should I spend time with laments? Laments, fly over, fly over. But the Lutheran pastor, as Thor told us, invites people to lament. You, you've heard these stories. I have, too. You're, you're talking to someone, and, and uh, they say, well, my pastor told me to never get mad at God. And you think, wow, I wonder if that pastor ever read his Bible, right? Or the book of Job, or laments. So laments uh, begin early, all right? Um, so Rachel can't have children. Why should I live? Uh, you know, Moses, Exodus 5, why have you mistreated this people? Giddy up, get along, Gideon, right? Uh, Judges 6, why has all this happened to us? 65 of the 150 psalms are psalms of lament. Is that about true? This is our psalm scholar here. Yeah, would you say that's true? Oh, good, 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 good. This is objective, you understand. I mean, it's 65, 70, 60. It, um, but but the, the, the point being is that there would be a lot of psalms that express lament. In fact, in, in Psalm 88, Psalm 88 is the only psalm that, of lament that has no resolution. Because usually they lament and then, you know, uh, they re they remember Yahweh's kezid, his loyal love, and and they all live happily ever after, right? Um, but in Psalm 88, it ends with this Hebrew word mock shock, uh, which is of course related to the Hebrew word koshek, which means darkness. So Psalm 88, at least in Hebrew, the last word is darkness. So what does that teach us? It's okay to not be okay. Sometimes there's just not resolution. See? Um, and of course, then there's an entire book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. So we don't want to fly over these. Um, we want to invite people to, to express their pain, their agony, their frustration, their anger with God, right? It, it, it's all over the place in the New Testament. Um, so in Job chapter 3, which I said, the, the darkest chapter in the book, all right, he uses words like darkness, night, blackness, graver, and death. And, and, and we have these five questions. Why? So, so <laughs> going back to Scripture, interpret Scripture, where do Old Testament laments begin? Job, Job. Of course, the greatest lament would be Eli, Eli, Lama Sabathani, right? Uh, my God, my God, Lama, why have you abandoned me? So Job, why did not I perish at birth? Why were there knees to receive me? Why was I not hidden in the ground like a stillborn child? Why is life given to those in misery? Why is life given to a man? And a Lutheran pastor invites those questions. Do we have the answers? Sometimes we don't. We're like Elihu, right? We'll listen, we'll sympathize, we'll empathize, we'll pray, hoping that that person then will meet Jesus. Whoops, oh no, we're back on. Good. Um, so this is the point. We survive sorrow by going through it. All right? Now, now, I've chosen these words rather carefully. We never get past sorrow. All right? Time heals all wounds. I've got a theological word for that. 
baloney. All right. You don't get healed from some of this stuff, right? So you don't get past sorrow, but you can survive it. But you got to go through it, through it. So the pastor invites people to go through it. But we would rather what? Fly over. There are things that happen to us as children, things that happen to us at school, things that happen, that happen to us in marriage. We've never faced them. We wonder why we have anxieties and phobias and fears and low self-esteem. It's because we live with two words, fly over, damn the torpedoes, full steam ahead, right? We live in a world that gives us all kinds of ways to self-medicate, right? Yeah, so I don't have to face the questions in life. Um, I don't have to go through, I can just self-medicate. Um, but that doesn't work. It's just a matter of time before the toxic waste comes to the surface. So the Lutheran pastor invites people to go through their pain. This is what Jesus says. Blessed are those who mourn, who mourn, for they will be comforted. Not blessed are those who cover up their sorrow or ignore their sorrow, or deny their sorrow, or pretend that the sorrow doesn't exist. Those people don't get comforted, right? The book of Job says you're, you're blessed, you're happy, you're spiritually alive when you mourn, when you ask why. Um, and of course, David prays, even though I walk through, not above, not around, not over, not hopscotch, you know, uh, three feet above, it's through. We survive sorrow by going through it. Um, that's what the book of Job teaches us. And so how do we go through it? This is just a way uh, to, to help people um, lament. See, lament. Uh, it's an, a an acronym. Uh, care, care. So complain. As I said, it's okay not to be okay. In Job 3, he asked, why five times? Um, appeal. Appeal. Appeal to what? Appeal to God's nature, his character, his mercy, his compassion, his promises. So appeal to that. Um, our remind. People do this quite often in the Old Testament. God, you said. <laughs> right? You said you know, uh, that you would never leave me or forsake me. You said that you would provide for all my needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. You said that you are love. All right? So we remind God of gospel promises. Just about every lament uh, goes through this in some way, shape, or form in the Old Testament. And then we express. Express our trust in God's wisdom and the things we don't understand. You're God, I'm not. You're the potter, I'm the clay. Mold me and shape me after your will while I am waiting, yielded, and still. So that's how you survive. Of course, it's much more complex than that. I wish we could just do this in five minutes and we'd all be emotionally, spiritually healthy the rest of our lives, right? Um, but, but this is what the Lutheran pastor helps people with. Uh, it's okay to complain, um, but, but you don't stop there, right? Appeal, remind, express. So we also survive, remember, <laughs> just survive. Uh, we don't get past it, but we look beyond it. We look beyond it. I mean, that's the ending of the book of Job, right? Um, the, the, the great promises of the Bible uh, talk about uh, uh, the telos, going back to James 5, verse 11, the end, the end. Psalm 22, verse 1, of course, begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it ends, right? Psalm 22 ends with robust faith and deliverance. Uh, Psalm uh, 30, verse 5, again, 
Joy comes in the morning. Lamentations 3.23, your mercies are new every morning. When did God deliver Israel from Egypt? Anybody know this? In the morning, Exodus, 20, uh, Exodus uh, 14, verse 27. The Hebrew is lift note boker at the, at the turning of the morning. Um, when does Psalm 46 say God de delivers? In the morning. Same phrase, lift note boker, only appears two times in the Hebrew Bible. So Psalm 46 is talking about deliverance in the morning. There are long nights of life, but there's always joy in the morning. And as I said earlier, Jesus, of course, is the bright morning star. So we don't want people to fly over. We want them to slow down and learn to survive by going through it, survive by looking beyond it. Because the Good Friday lament in Psalm 22 was turned into a song of everlasting joy, right? There's the joy in the morning, the morning. All right, so, so what have we done with the Lutheran pastor in the book of Job? Um, we are Elihu's, and we're also pastors who invite and encourage, indeed instruct people how to lament um, so they can survive it, survive it. Another way Lutheran pastors would uh, use the book of Job would uh, be to uh, give people uh, a little bit more um, biblical wisdom uh, when they are suffering. And, and this is, as I said, when we're looking at James 5.11, this is a pivotal verse to understanding Job. Uh, when he has tested me, and, and as I said, this Hebrew word bakan here uh, means to, to, to uh, uh, smelt, right, uh, the dross uh, off of a, a precious mineral. Um, so that's what bakan means. Test doesn't mean like a multiple choice test or a true and false test. It means a fiery test, okay? And Job says, I will come forth as gold. So how does the Lutheran pastor help people understand their suffering? Now, now we're in the, the fourth model of suffering. Remember, I gave you four. Uh, we're in the Genesis 50, verse 20 model. You meant it for evil, God meant for good. All right, and that's the model of the book of Job. That's not the only model. Sometimes we don't know. I, I, I just don't think you're going to tell most people, right, um, who are grieving over the loss of a loved one on uh, October 1st in Las Vegas, uh, that, uh, well, God meant for evil, uh, or you meant for evil, God meant for good. You, you might say, you know what? I don't know. You might go to Deuteronomy 29, 29, right? It takes a very mature Christian to get to that fourth slot, uh, to, to be able to stomach and agree and swallow uh, you meant for evil, God meant for good, right? Some people never get there. Uh, and it takes a whole lot of Christian maturity. Um, but that's, that's the book of Job, all right? It's not confession absolution. It's not really hoping in gospel against the law. It's this one right here, all right? So how do we help people understand this? We want people to understand that there are at least five different uh, steps uh, to this uh, whole uh, enterprise of uh, suffering and, and suffering in terms of redemptive suffering. First, shock. Shock. When your world falls apart. Job uh, 2.13. Um, they didn't say anything for seven days. Their system was in shock. My hot water heater went out on Saturday. And I had to take two cold showers yesterday, one before church and one after I went running. And I will tell you, that is a spiritual experience. All right, all right. Taking a just, I mean, have you tried that recently? All right. I mean, a cold shower. All right. <laughs> You're just shocked. All right. I mean, I was, I, I'll just tell you this because 
I'm getting on a plane, all right? I was screaming in these cold showers, all right? You try one and, and uh, see how you feel, okay? All right? It's, the point is it's a shock. It's like plunging into cold water. You can prepare all you want for life and its strategy, but when it happens, it's a shock, all right? And it, it is something you scream about if you're, you know, in <laughs> a cold shower. Job and his friends, they don't even say anything, all right? So, so if people are in shock, when, when you show up at the hospital and they don't want to talk <laughs> and they don't know what to say, it's like they just hit a cold shower, right? Or a polar bear plunge. Um, so, so we would expect this. This is what the book of Job teaches us. Silence. Silence. God doesn't show up, right? Doesn't respond to email, doesn't Facebook us back, doesn't text us back. For 35 chapters, I've counted them, God is silent. And in Job chapter 23, Job laments this. It says in 23, 8 to 9, Job looks to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south. The four points of the horizon, God can't be found. So expect it. God will be silent. He will be deus absconditus, the hidden God. And we say, well, what gives? Matthew 7, 7, ask, you'll be given, seek, you'll find, knock, and the door will be open. God, why aren't you answering my prayers? So expect it. This is how the book of Job unfolds. Struggle, struggle when you don't understand. So this is what Job does. See, he keeps struggling. See, why? Why this? Why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me right now? See, so you keep struggling. See, I love Job chapter 23, 17. It says, I am not silenced by the darkness. Isn't that great? I'm not silenced by the darkness. You keep struggling. You keep going to church, <laughs> right? You keep praying. You, you, you keep saying the Apostles' Creed. You don't feel it. You don't want to be there, but you keep wrestling. We refuse to let the darkness have the last word. Again, Job 23, 17. I'm not silenced by the darkness. So there's struggle. So we've gone from shock to silence, and there's struggle. Then, of course, the, the, the big deal, right, in the book of Job is sanctification. Sanctification, God doesn't want to make me happy. God wants to make me holy, right? All things are working together for good. We said this, so I'm conformed to the image of Jesus, Romans 8. 29. Um, so, sanctification. God turns evil into good. All right? And it was evil. It was evil. All right? Job uses the word evil. <laughs> In Job 42.10, Yahweh restored Job's fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. So, so those of you who know a little Hebrew, know that the Hebrew here would be a um, Hebrew that sounds like this, shuv shavut, shuv shavut. And it, it's very common in uh, Old Testament prophets, like my good friend, famous Amos, okay, uh, in chapter 9, verse 14. Uh, so shuv shavut, it, I mean, it's translated here, I'm just reading from the ESV, uh, restored his fortunes. But shuv shavut means a complete turning of the tables. It means the, the cursing is now blessed. The darkness is now light. Uh, the bitterness is now sweet. Uh, the hell is now heaven. See, it's a complete turn. So restore of fortunes doesn't really get it. It means there's resurrection from the dead. All right? Shuv shavut. And it's always used of nations, except now, Job's the only person this phrase uh, is used to describe in Job 42.10. 
So God turns evil into good. See, if we can't go there, we're stuck. We're just stuck. If you can't do anything good out of this God, then I'm not sure if I have biblical faith. Because this is the heart of the biblical message, right? Good Friday. Arrested, abruptly, tried, unjustly, sentenced, callously, mocked repeatedly, abandoned, ruthlessly, beaten, brutally, crucified, barbarously, but risen triumphantly, right? Um, this, is, this is the heart of the biblical message. Uh, the shuv shavut, the turning of the tables. Uh, so God turns evil into good, right? He makes me holy not happy. And then, service, when we use our pain for God's glory. So God wants to take what we're most embarrassed about, what we're most ashamed of, what we most regret, and use that for good. Who can better help parents of a Down syndrome child than parents who have a Down syndrome child? Who can better help someone going through a divorce than someone who's been divorced? Who can better help someone struggling with an addiction than someone who struggled with an addiction? The very thing we don't want to talk about is the very thing God wants us to use to help other people. We use our pain for God's glory. So a Lutheran pastor is, is going to try and move people through these different stages of grief so that finally, and it may take years to get to this point, where I'm finally able to talk publicly about one of the greatest shames of my life and how God has turned that into something beautiful. Ecclesiastes 3.11 comes to mind. He has made everything beautiful in its time. See? Um, that's where we want to take people. That's where the book of Job takes us. All right. So um, what I'd like to do at this point is do our uh, Q&A a little bit, and then I have a bit of a final uh, word to say. Uh, so we are at uh, uh, 11 till the hour. So uh, we'll see if there are any uh, Q&A out there. Uh, and then we will save about uh, two minutes to uh, wrap everything up. Anybody? Yes, sir. Me again. Hey, I got I, my question for you is in our uh, leading of our people through lament. Mm -hmm. How do we do that in a way that does not result in our people saying, therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes? after pouring our heart out to God? How do, we, how do we lament in a way that is not sinful? Right. No, I mean, that's a great question because um, Job, uh, part of his lament, right, as we've said now, especially in chapter 16, uh, you know, he regrets that, that he saw God. So, so this is one of the great ironies in the book of Job is Job saw God as a behemoth and a leviathan, as a chaos monster trying to destroy him, see? And that's what he repents of. Um, so how do we encourage lament without this accusatory, cynical, pessimistic side that we see uh, in Job? Um, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think we can give them, um, you know, the just repeating probably what I said, is that uh, we, we lament by going through it and we lament by looking beyond it. See, Job couldn't, we can't blame him too much, but he couldn't see the telos, he couldn't see the end. And, and we need to hold in front of people the end. See, the final end. Yet when my skin is destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God, right? Job 19, 26. That's what we... This, we get, we just think, well, it's always going to be this way, Pastor. No, it won't. See? So I would say that would be part of my strategy. Um, 
Stephen Covey had this book, you know, 25 years ago, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, right? It's a good book, although he's a Mormon, um, doesn't have the, the, you know, doesn't pretend to be a theologian at all. Um, but one of the seven habits is what? Begin with the end in mind. Eric knows that. Um, and that, that's, that's really great wisdom, right? Begin with the, so I'm going to begin the lament with the end in mind. This is, this is really one of the, the sub-themes of the Bible. Um, and, and we see this in, for example, um, 2 Chronicles 20, fat, fat, Jehoshaphat, ninth century Judean king. And, and he uh, organizes a Levitical choir to sing, Hodu le Yahweh ki tov ki le olam kazdo. Give thanks to the Lord, he's good, his mercy endures forever. And this Levitical choir, 2 Chronicles 20, goes for singing the song, and the enemies are defeated. So what's the point? You thank God for the victory before the victory. That's what they did at Jericho, right, in Joshua 6. See, they're, they're going around uh, once a day for six days in joyful procession. So, so we want people to thank God for the victory before the victory. Uh, this is what Paul and Silas do in Acts chapter 17, right? They're not singing stricken, smitten, and afflicted, right? They're singing jailhouse rock. No, 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 I'm just kidding. All right. But the jailhouse rock, and they are singing hymns in prison at midnight. They're thanking God for the earthquake before there's the earthquake that will set them free. This is the book of Revelation. Throughout the book of Revelation, we were given the, the heavenly song, right? All wisdom, glory, power, and might belong to the Lamb who is slain. So, so we thank God for the victory before we have the victory. This is what Jesus does. This is what Jesus does. Uh, let me just uh, look at this. Um, in uh, Matthew chapter 26, one, one of these uh, verses that it's kind of easy just to, to read past and miss the, the profound nature of what's going on. Um, and um, in uh, chapter 26 of St. Matthew's Gospel, uh, and here I want to um, find the verse here, and time is ticking. And I just have my Greek Bible, and um, I'm looking for, um, let me see here, behold, okay, um, they sang a hymn, uh, and they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, okay, I'm going, okay, okay, verse, oh, so thank you so much. Yeah, 2630, there it is, with the synoptic parallels in uh, Mark and Luke. They sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. What hymn did they sing? They sang the Egyptian Halal, right? Here's Mr. Psalm here, Psalm 113 to 18. So, and how does Psalm 118 go? Uh, verse uh, 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 20, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made, let's rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus is singing that in the Pesach, the Passover. He's thanking God for the victory before the victory. Uh, so this is, a, as I said, a minor current throughout the, the Bible. Um, so when I'm, I'm in the lament, everything says I'm doomed. This is it. It's all over. The fat laid his song. Mighty Casey is struck out, throwing the towel. But faith says, I'm going to keep singing. Yeah, I'm going to keep singing. So that might be one way to keep the end in mind. Yeah, right, right, right. Walter Brueggemann calls this guerrilla liturgy. <laughs> I like that, guerrilla liturgy. It's not warfare, but it's underground. It, it's just very subversive. See, there's a, there's a king out there. <laughs> His name is Jesus, and he's coming again to set it all right. We have time maybe for one more question. Pardon me now? Okay. It is. It is. And I don't have the time nor the, the, the file open 
to do justice to that. But, but I, I'm sure that Paul is saying that, that suffering is part of the Christian's life. There's no doubt about that. Um, right, right. My suffering doesn't add to Jesus' work of redemption. We know that. But, but it is part of the Christian's life. Um, right, right. So, so Peter says, um, don't be surprised at the fiery trials, right, in First Peter chapter 2. Okay, well, um, I want to just show you um, some conclusions here and then a picture, all right? The issue in the book of Job is whether relationship between God and people is rooted in what we do or what God does, and it's rooted in what God does and who he is. Why do we serve God? For what we can get or what we can give? Uh, the accuser lost his bet. Yahweh wins. Job serves God freely. Take away everything. Job isn't perfect, but Job still hangs with Yahweh. This is a great verse. This John 9, 3. That just summarized the whole book of Job. It was not that this man sinned, remember the blind man, or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. It's a great way to talk about Job. Here's this painting, all right? It was composed in 1924 by Otto Dix, and it's called the War Triptych, right? Uh, because it has three parts to it. Otto Dix fought in World War I. He was wounded in battle, and he received the Iron Cross. He was a German in World War I. He styled it like you would a painting that would grace a church altar with a centerpiece of the crucifixion and two side wings filled with angels and saints. Only instead of the story of God and images of salvation, Otto Dix filled it with images of war. Well, we can see that. There in the center, he painted what was left after the war to end all wars. The only living figure is a man wearing a gas mask, you can see that in the middle, to save him from the poison air. Into this dark landscape of human destruction, however, Dix has placed a detail. Do you see it? You see the corpse on the top in the middle, pointing the finger? downward, that makes all the difference in the world. This bony finger stretched out by the person on the bridge is pointing us to another person. Follow the bony finger and you see the person buried upside down. Right there. Now, who in the world would that be? Buried upside down within the pile of corpses is Jesus. It's easy to miss that, isn't it? It's easy to miss Jesus when all we can see would be piles of corpses and the littered landscape of pain and deep brokenness. But that's why we need the book of Job, <laughs> because Job repeatedly points us to Jesus, the Jesus who not only has solidarity with pain and suffering and rejection, but of course, all the more, the Jesus who is the Redeemer. I know that my Redeemer lives. Five words that finally change literally everything. That's the book of Job, and that's Jesus. And that's the end, the tello. So thank you so much for your invitation to come to Fergus Falls.
Thank you, Dr. Lassling. We can say I think wholeheartedly we're so we're blessed by this time. Thank you for sharing not only in this lecture, but sharing your, your resources. Um, as I was telling some students during the break, um, you know, as I went through Concordia, I had a few classes with you, but you were continually gracious with your resources, lecture notes um, that have not only benefited me, but continue to benefit many of us here too and, and the church. So thank you for, for that gracious work. Um, before we go, let's pray. Um, I don't know that we have any other announcements or anything to make um, at this point, but uh, let's, let's pray together as we close. Gracious Father, we are, we are thankful for this time. Under your word, in your word, we thank you for, for teaching us, Holy Spirit. We thank you for um, your work among us. As we reflect on this book of Job this morning, we all um, feel in our own experience and in the lives of others that we care about and know the, <clears throat> the struggle, um, maybe in part, that, that Job had. It's very real for us and very real for those we care about. We thank you for the word of hope that uh, has come to us today. Remind us that our Redeemer lives. And uh, we ask, I ask God that you would give hope uh, to those here today that are, are struggling with uh, walking through the darkness. And would you equip us, Lord, as you've comforted us, would you use us to comfort others that need that same hope, that same word of comfort and presence with them uh, today. Uh, we join together uh, now, Lord, in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious towards you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in God's peace.